I know it's not even September yet, but it's always October in my heart. I don't know about y'all, but I was definitely one of those kids who got really into dark occult stuff at what was probably an inappropriately early age. I remember being really into the concepts of changeling children and fairy rings that trapped you inside or forced you to dance until you went mad or died. Some people grow out of stuff like that and other people become professional Dungeons and Dragons YouTubers. So when Cobalt Press sent me their Book of Ebon Tides for a sponsored video, which is a book all about the Plane of Shadow and the Fae and other creatures that reside there, I didn't even really want to make a video about it so much as I just wanted to drop everything and run a whole dark Fae campaign. But life is short and D&D is long and they are paying me to make a video, not run a campaign. So instead of just doing a book review, I thought you could come along with me as I outline the concept for an entire D&D campaign set in the Shadow Realm. In this video, we will flesh out a party of four player characters using the races and classes from the books, we will link their stories together, and we will plot out their first adventure. Hopefully this will not just show you what this setting book is capable of, but also give you a little insight into how I, as a DM, weave together player character backstories and develop the tone and initial arc of a campaign. Let's get spooky! Give me a quick 20 seconds for the essential details before we jump into the campaign. Kobold Press sponsored this video so I can talk about two new books that they have released. The Book of Ebon Tides, The Book of Ebon Tides, which is a Plane of Shadow campaign setting for 5e, and Tales from the Shadows, a collection of 14 dark fantasy adventures set in the Shadow Realm. These books were kickstarted last year for more than four times their initial funding goal, so if you order them now, you're also benefiting from all the additional materials that their stretch goals added on. You can pick up both books in hardcover and or PDF at the link in the description. Let's imagine a party of four player characters ready to adventure together in the Shadow Realm. Up first, a wayward human once lost in the shadows. Kenna Talward was once a human before she lost her way. Many mages use the Shadow Roads to travel quickly between distant places, but when Kenna paid one for such a passage, she strayed from the path and found herself lost in the Shadow Realm. A memory thief found her wandering the woods, weakened by shadow corruption. She was an easy target. The thief siphoned some essential memory from her, though she knows not which, only that there is a hollow place in her now. She sometimes feels a deep, aching grief that leaves her weeping without knowing why. Whatever her loss, the Mother of Sorrows was drawn to it. She offered Kenna a bargain give herself to the shadows, and become immune to their corrupting influence. She would be granted arcane power so that she could avenge her suffering in the name of the Mother of Sorrows. But before she can take that vengeance, Kenna will need to recall what exactly she has lost. When I read that sometimes people get trapped in the Plane of Shadow by straying from the path of a Shadow Road, my fairy tale obsession came out in full force. The Shadow Roads are a really key part of this setting, so let's go over what they are really quick. The Plane of Shadow is, by nature, constantly shifting. This is what the Ebon Tides from the title refers to, not an actual ocean, but the tide-like ebb and flow of the shadows, which take landmarks and settlements with them if they're not anchored somehow. It's the Shadow Roads that anchor them, tying them to other places through a magical binding. These roads are also accessible to some magic adepts from the mortal world. They can be used as methods of convenient travel, stepping into the shadows in one place and out of them in another place far away. However, straying from the path along the way leaves the traveler lost in the Plane of Shadow. Of course, a mortal trapped in the Plane of Shadow will eventually become corrupted. This corruption can cause a creature to be weakened in various ways by bright light and eventually turns them into a shadow thrall who refuses to willingly leave the plane. If your player characters aren't native to the Shadow Realm, they have to make charisma saves for every week that they spend there, taking levels of shadow corruption when they fail. Since I'm imagining an entire campaign set in the Plane of Shadow, it's important that a human character be able to withstand this corruption long term. One way to do that is to make Kenna an umbral human, a human who has been twisted by exposure to shadow. If this happens over generations, it creates a changeling, but if it happens through a sudden transformation, it creates a type of umbral human called, somewhat satirically, the Gifted. But who or what transformed Kenna into one of the gifted. Well, y'all know I'm a sucker for a warlock, so the Mother of Sorrows warlock patron immediately caught my eye. But it wasn't until I was flipping through the monsters section of the book that it all fell into place. See, Shadow Fae themselves don't experience the same emotions and passions that other creatures do, but they find those feelings fascinating. So they've built a robust trade market for emotions as consumable goods. Part of this market are the memory thieves, humanoids who have been trained to capture the memories and emotions of other creatures, so those feelings can be sold to the Fae. 
The Mother of Sorrows offers her warlocks vengeance for their suffering, but she was specifically born of the suffering of parents who have lost children. I think it would be super interesting for Kenna's player to know that she had lost some core memory, but not what that memory was. And over the course of the campaign, it would be revealed through the guidance of her patron that she is, in fact, a mother, and it was her memory of her child that was stolen from her. Of course, as much as I love a good surprise backstory twist, all this would be dependent on the player being okay with the DM keeping backstory secrets, and with themes of parenthood and family separation. That would be some key Session Zero conversation for a game like this. Once Kenna learns the truth, her new quest can be finding and potentially avenging her lost child. There are also a bunch of new spells in this book, and the Warlock list is full of cool ones like Blade of Blood and Bone, which lets you draw a dagger or short sword made of your own bone from your body and attack with it, which is very locked tomb of them. Also, there's a fifth level spell called Feast of Flesh that causes an enemy to cannibalize its allies. It's very fucked up. I love it. Crix was perfectly content as one of the many shadow goblins peopling the city of Fandival. By day, he scavenged floating memories from the waters of the Black River Styx, and by night, he drank himself stupid in whatever filthy tavern was nearest. Once, during a drunken brawl, a gaunt-looking old man bit Crix. He woke the next morning with a fever which racked his body for days, until finally, he died. But as the fever sweat cooled on his waxy skin, some form of half-life raised him. This newly reborn Crix found himself ravenous. He suddenly hungered for living flesh, and even more strangely, for the very shadows that infused this plane. The more of this dark magic he consumed, the stronger he grew. Sometimes he would be filled with rage, and the raw shadow would seep from his body, enshrouding him in darkness. His hunger grows every day, and Crix Hollowgut is beginning to realize that he may need to leave Fandival in order to truly sate it. The Darakul race is not new to the Book of Ebon Tides, it's actually part of the Midgard setting, and it's also detailed in Tome of Heroes. But while these undead have to hide their nature in other settings, they enjoy relative freedom in the Shadow Realm, even building out their own massive civilization called the Twilight Empire. Since the Darakul all began life as a living creature, the subraces are each associated with an existing race. By making Crix a Shadow Goblin before he fell sick, he gets several Shadow Goblin racial traits, like size, language, and walking speed, and a Shadow Goblin specific skill called Dark Deed, which can frighten another creature. There's a goblin city in the Plain of Shadows called Fandival, which lies on the banks of the Black River Styx, where it meets the Shade Sea. Many of the goblins there work as boat builders or fishermen, or run market stalls at the waterfront. The intense hunger of the Darakul felt like a great companion to the new barbarian subclass in this book, the Shadow Gnar. These barbarians actually consume raw shadow energy and use it to manifest magical abilities, from creating a smoke screen that gives other creatures disadvantage on attacks, to to regaining hit points from feeding on the shadows. While most who take this path absorb shadow magic to protect others from it, some just want to feed on that energy, which felt right for Crix. Now, one of the major downsides of playing Adara Cool as a PC is that you have to consume raw meat every day to satisfy your hunger for flesh. And while that meat could certainly be that of an animal rather than a person, the book says that living flesh is pretty scarce in the Shadow Realm, so a starving Dara Cool might be tempted to do a little murder. And while they may be little assholes, the Shadow Goblin of Fandival are described as having strong communities with their friends and families. So if Crix found himself sometimes considering taking a bite out of a neighbor, I think that the remains of the Shadow Goblin inside him would want to seek out a solution, such as, for example, the crackling forests. These alien trees, not native to the Plain of Shadow, seem to be made of bone and cartilage rather than wood. They bleed a thick, stinking black sap that most creatures find revolting. The Darakul, however, have found that it nourishes them just as well as living plants. They cultivate these trees as a food source in the Twilight Empire, making that a worthy pilgrimage for Crix to pursue to start him off on his adventure. From the moment Onyx Claw was born, the other bear folk recognized the cub's affinity for the darkness. Their ash-gray coat, covered in strange black markings, identified them as Shadowborn. Like other such cubs, Onyx Claw had a natural resistance to the effects of the shadow, but also what many of their community thought of as an unnatural attraction to it. When they traveled to the Hawthorne Grove to train amongst the other barefolk druids, Onyx Claw's connection to nature took an unusual form. Like their fellows, they could assume the form of a wild creature, like the twilight purple deer or dark furred squirrels that make their home in the Shadow Realm's forests. But sometimes, they would shift instead into a mass of living shadow. The bear folk pride themselves on being a bastion of light in a dark place, but for Onyx Claw, who craves the shadows, no satisfaction can ever be found in these protected glades. 
Only out there, amongst the shadows, can they find their true purpose. Bear folk, like the Darakul, are also a race originating in Kobold Press's Midgard setting, but in the context of the Plane of Shadow, they work towards fighting back the shadow corruption and creating safe communities to act as a source of light for both their own kin and wayward travelers. They are very much painted as noble defenders of the light, present in the Plane of Shadow specifically to fight against its nature. However, over the centuries of carving out their druidic communities amongst the shadows, the bear folk born on this plane have slowly become influenced by their surroundings leading to the Shadowborn subrace. Bear folk with this distinction are born in shades of gray, have dark vision, and can hide and be stealthy easily in dim light or darkness. While it must be a benefit to bear folk warriors to be less threatened by the darkness, I can't help but feel like the Shadowborn would be treated a little warily by a culture like this. If their whole purpose is fighting the shadows, they've got to be at least a little mistrustful of a creature that seems to have a natural affinity for them. Many bear folk train as either druids or shadow gnar barbarians in order to defend their grove, so it makes sense that Onyx Claw would join many of their fellows in pursuing a druidic tradition. And there's a perfect new druid subclass in the Book of Ebon Tides, the Circle of Shadows. Druids in this circle get access to some additional spells and have the option to wild shape not just into an animal, but into an umbral form, which is basically a shadow. At later levels, they can raise and command shadows as separate creatures, and even create magical darkness. In the description for the Circle of Shadows, it's noted that while other druids might fight to preserve some sort of natural balance, druids in this circle recognize that all things eventually return to darkness, and therefore don't see darkness as something that needs to necessarily be fought. This seems like it would really clash with the core goals of the bear folk in this realm, which makes for great motivation to push a player character like Onyx Claw out of the nest and into an adventuring party. There are a number of new druid spells in this book as well, like Hibernation, which lets you put another creature into a healing sleep, or Deep Roots of the Moon, which actually allows you to create a shadow road of your own. Also, since the Shadow Realm is its own plane, it has some of its own beasts, which are mostly just variations on animals on the Prime Material plane, but could still be really fun for flavoring Wild Shape. The Eventide family line held only a minor position in the vast Shadowfey Court of Night and Magic, and though Aravni, the youngest Eventide daughter, may claim that it was divine calling that led her to become a road warden, only a fool would fail to note that the profession carries with it a level of respect and prestige that can only elevate the Eventide name amongst the other nobles of the court. By committing herself to walk the roads each spring, repairing and restoring these essential bindings that anchor the court, preventing it from being lost to the ebon tides, Aravni has opened doors for herself and for her family. So far, the revelry and indulgence of her newfound position in Shadowfay society has seemed a fair reward for the drudgery of maintaining the Shadow Roads, but there are dangers that Aravni has not yet faced outside the protective walls of the court, dangers that may heavily outweigh the nights of gaiety and gossip. You didn't think I was gonna build an entire party for the Shadow Realm without having a Fey in it, right? The Fey Courts are a huge part of the Plane of Shadow. There are more than a dozen courts outlined in the book, and that doesn't even include the mysterious lost courts that have been unmoored and swept away by the Ebon Tides. I love a good fairy court as a setting, and having a player who belongs to one of those courts sets up a campaign to have at least a few adventures within its walls, which would be a lot of fun. But something has to take a court noble out of their cushy lifestyle and into the world for a dangerous adventure adventure, which is where the Road Wardens come in. Since the Shadow Roads are so essential to the safety and function of the cities, courts, and settlements in this plane, naturally the people who defend and maintain them are highly necessary and highly respected. The book notes that the attempted sabotage of roads through tearing up paving stones, changing the terrain with magic, or breaking the enchantment of their binding points is common. Road Wardens don't just stop the roads from natural decay, but also from attack. A cut road can set a settlement adrift, perhaps never to be located again. Making Aravni a cleric also made sense because the Plane of Shadow has its own pantheon. Among others, this pantheon includes Sarastra, the queen of the Court of Night and Magic, patron of the Shadow Fae, and original shaper of the Shadow Realm as it exists today. It's reasonable that a member of this court might dedicate themselves not just as a vassal to their queen, but as a conduit for her divine power. Just like the other casting classes, there are some brand new cleric spells, including Drafen's Bane of Excellence, which cancels an 
an opponent's next natural 20, or Grim Harvest, which allows you to capture the energy of a dying or recently dead creature and use it to your own benefit. I also think you could start off a player like this with a cool weapon or armor as part of their role as Road Warden, and there are plenty of really exciting new items, magic items, weapons, and armor in the Book of Ebon Tides. For example, you could give Aravni Umbral Armor, which hides your tracks and makes you hard to hit with ranged attacks as long as you're not in bright light. You could totally just call that the uniform of the Road Wardens from this court as a fun way to tie a unique item into that character's story. Speaking of items that Aravni might have, as a Shadow Fae, she has likely purchased memories and emotions in consumable form, which could definitely lead to some interesting interactions with Kenno once they're in a party together. There's a list of memory filters, like the filter of boundless joy or the filter of righteous anger, that award temporary benefits to specific ability checks, attacks, and other actions. So that's the party! Kenna, the Umbral Human Warlock, Crix, the Shadow Goblin Darakul Barbarian, Onyxclaw, the Shadowborn Bearfolk Druid, and Aravni, the Shadow Fae Cleric. In this case, I created all those characters, but let's assume for a moment that my players have instead come up with these PCs, and it is now my job to figure out how to interlink them and set them on a path together towards adventure. First of all, some of these characters might naturally clash. It's likely that Kenna, who was victimized by a memory thief, will not get along well with Aravni, who probably downs memories like Shadow Fae White Claw. And if Crix ever attempts to take a bite out of a fellow party member in a moment of hangry weakness, I could see some really hard feelings developing there. So the first thing I'd want to do as a DM is establish connections between characters and shared goals. I've been known to require that every player at the table choose another character to establish an existing relationship with, just to give the party a starting point for a bond. In this case, perhaps Onyx Claw would run into Kenna on the road and decide to take her under their protection, thinking her vulnerable and having been raised in a community that aids travelers. And since Crix used to scavenge memories from the Black River Styx, perhaps he sold these to a merchant who supplied the Eventide family with filters, giving him a sort of a distant business connection with Aravni. As for a party-wide connection, in a place as dangerous as the Shadow Realm, survival can be a very motivating shared goal, particularly if characters are cut off from whatever safety or protection they're used to. Kenna is probably in a constant state of defensive fear, Onyx Claw has just left the safety of the Grove for the first time, and Crix is both a first-time traveler and a danger to himself, so that just leaves Aravni. So one of my first steps as a DM would be to find a way to cut Aravni off from her access to the court, at least temporarily, perhaps by means of exile. This would give her a reason to ally with the others. But before we do that, it's easy enough to throw them all into a deadly situation together to get some good old trauma bonding started. This is where Tales from the Shadows comes in. That's the collection of 14 adventures set within the Plane of Shadow. Since these adventures are written for an array of levels, from one to eight, you could very easily work your way through them one by one, shaping a campaign around these individual episodic quests, or even finding your own way to create a thread that links them all together. Or, if you want the freedom to build your own campaign arc, these adventures could still make a great starting point. Personally, I really like to shape a campaign arc around the player character's goals and backstories, so with this party, I would want to make sure that the campaign brought Kenna to reclaim her lost memories, brought Crix to the Twilight Empire, enabled Honest Claw to find or create a community that accepts them, and reunited Aravni with her family and her court. Even better if I could tie some of these together, perhaps locating Kenna's bottled memory in the Twilight Empire, so that location is relevant to more than one character. But first, we need a starting point. As I was reading through these adventures, there was one that really struck me as a great starting point for this party in particular, and seemed like a good way to bring everybody together. It's called The Weeper in Shadow, and it's written for a party of third-level adventurers, which is actually perfect, because assuming I'm not playing with any brand new folks, I like starting at third level because everybody's a little less squishy and has some more exciting abilities. In this adventure, players hear tales of a living, malicious forest called the Womb Wield. Most times the Womb Wield sleeps, but when it awakens, it births a horrible monster called the Weeper in Shadow. This forest, like any location that isn't anchored by a shadow road, drifts on the ebon tides, so no one is ever quite sure where it is while it slumbers. But the signs of its awakening have been spotted in the Queenswood near the Court of Night and Magic, and as a road warden, Aravni has been sent to investigate it. The others are on the road, too. Kenna received cryptic direction from her patron to travel this way, Crix passes through this area on his way from Fandival to the Twilight Empire, and Onyx Claw could have been sent this way by the Bearfolk, having also heard of the threat of the Wombwield, the exact kind of corruption and darkness that they train their warriors to fight. If the horrible screams of the woods victims don't motivate the players to investigate, Aravni could receive a sending from her road warden captain requesting an update, and upon receiving it, 
could be told that the Awakening is more advanced than they thought, they won't have time to send reinforcements, and Aravni is authorized to contract any capable-looking nearby travelers to help her drive off the threat under the promise of later payment. Once they've completed their adventure and slain the Weeper in Shadow, they will, of course, need to stick with Aravni long enough to retrieve their payment. Of course, since the Wombwield isn't connected to a Shadow Road, their triumphant return might deposit them far from where they entered, keeping the party linked for the journey back. At which point I would probably bring in the whole exile plotline for Aravni, maybe that she was framed for something by some noble who has beef with her or her family, binding her together with the rest of the party, none of whom have any true allies except for each other. And we're off! They could go all sorts of places and pursue all sorts of goals, forging friendships along the way for as long as the players could keep their Saturday mornings open. That hits a little close to home to be funny. All of this is just one example of the kind of campaign that you could run with these books, but you don't even have to set your entire campaign in the Shadow Plane. You can dip in and out of it just like any other plane, for a single adventure or a short arc. This book makes a great addition to the Midgard setting, which it shares some races, gods, and other concepts with, but it can also be linked to any setting that has a Shadow Plane. If you want to pick up the Book of Ebon Tides and Tales from the Shadows, make sure to check out the link in the description. You can get them in hardcover, PDF, or both. How about you guys? Would you play in or DM a campaign set entirely in the Shadow Plane? Let me know in the comments, and if you want to learn more about more of Kobold Press's third-party content for 5e, check out this video that I made all about the Tome of Heroes.